Okay, great. So we're live on YouTube now and we're also recording. So let me go ahead and introduce session number 12. Oh, okay. Let's see. A little bit of screen sharing issues. Okay, great. So this session is Futures Literacy Through Art, Lesson learns, Lessons Learned from Kids in Kuwait. And we have Dr. Manal joining us. Dr. Manal is the founder and managing partner of Think Tank Strategy Consulting, specializing in advisory and learning of strategy, strategic foresight, and futures thinking and design. She is the chairman of Kuwait Society for Strategic Planning, a non-profit established in 2017. She has been advising government members on strategy development, implementation, and communication for change for 10 years, including recently KFAS, the Man Assurance, and Ministry of Interior. She is also selected as one of the most inspirational persons in Kuwait by those who inspire international organizations, and was also selected as one of 60 powerful female leaders by the United Nations Women in 2018. In 2021, Dr. Manal was featured in the Kuwait Country Report promoted by BBC as part of the top 10 consulting industry leaders in Kuwait. And she'll be sharing about her experiences on teachers teaching futures thinking to a group of young children in Kuwait during a one-week camp. And we'll be also discussing key takeaways and future directions for teaching the future in Kuwait. And just as a reminder, welcome everyone again I am Amna from Teach the Future. We are a global nonprofit working to include futures literacy in the school curriculum. And this session is hosted by Teach the Future and Young Voices Network in partnership with the Millennium Project. Pearl Futures Day is a 24 hour long intergenerational conversation about the future and a space to involve both young people and futurists in anticipating and influencing the future, both in and out of the school. We are live on YouTube and we would encourage you all to keep your videos open if you can. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Amna to take the stage. Thank you so much, Amna. I am very excited to be here today and um, I'm glad I, I was able to join in the last session because just that last question that, that they asked uh, brings up a lot, of, a lot of thought and a lot of ideas. Um, uh, I'm gonna, just before we start, um, I'd like to share my screen. So um, uh, would you have to? You should be make... able to, you're a co-host. Okay. So if you just allow me to do that. Thank you guys for your patience. It's um, I'm almost there. It's just, it's not connecting. Just for...
in the meantime, I'll just. Oh, did you? Were you saying something? No, no, I'm good. Go okay. Ahead. Yeah, in the meantime, I'll just encourage everybody to share in the chat where they are tuning in from and what time it is in your part of the world. And we see your screen. Great. Okay, great. So I think it'll be easier to do it this way. Okay, so I've been, let's say, dabbling in futures thinking and uh, strategic foresight uh, for about eight, nine years now. And for me personally, when I think about the impact that this has had on, on my own life, on my own personal life, on my professional life, it I cannot give this framework enough credit for transforming the way that I looked at life and I looked at the future and I looked at opportunities in, in so many different ways. And by engaging with similar minded people, by engaging with professionals, I was able to reach, uh, you know, uh, new ideas, new heights. However, when I engaged with children, that was a completely different story. So let me introduce you to Talal. Talal is a clever nine year old who I had the privilege and pleasure of hosting in the camp that we're going to discuss today. So I had an interesting conversation with Dalal, and this conversation made such an impact on me uh, that it actually motivates a lot of the work that I do and I'm planning on doing uh, for children in Kuwait when it comes to teaching future, future literacy, uh, talking about the future, uh, making them understand that we do have a choice and how things progress and how things move. So I was talking to Talal in, in one of the days and, and he comes into um, the studio where we had the, the camp and he says, uh, Dr. Manal, I'm really tired. Is it okay if I lay down on the couch today? I said, yeah, absolutely. You can lay down on the couch. And I started asking him questions about his day and what he was doing and, and you know, how he spent his day and, and how come he was so tired. He said, well, I woke up in the morning. I had to go to school. I had to spend eight hours in school. Teachers telling me what to do. Um, I had to do homework. I had to come home. Um, I had to work on my homework. And then I had to go to soccer practice where the coach was telling me what to do. And then I had to come back from that. And my mom had signed me up for paddle practice. And then I had to do work on that as well. And then now I'm here. Um, and then I have to go back home and, and see what else I have to do. And that stuck with me. That word, I have to do it, stuck with me. And and it stuck with me for a reason. And I'll, 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 I'll expand on that as we get to that part. But But I want you to keep his words in mind as we move forward, I want you to remember that he has to do a lot of the things that he does in his life. He has to sit in class for eight hours. He has to do his homework the way it's asked to be done. He has to practice soccer. He has to do a lot of things. So by bringing in future literacy and by making sure that we equip the next generation with future literacy, we're not just helping them think in a different way. We're not allowing them to use a different tool set that they can carry over with them in different parts of their lives, but we're also teaching them things like adaptation resilience, words that were used in, in, in and I, I was excited to hear in our previous session, and I'm sure that they were used multiple times throughout the conversations today. We are not just providing them with, uh, you know, with, with, with a different way of looking at things, but we're also giving them the power to thrive in an ever-changing world. 
everybody's talking about how fast, how dynamic this world is. Technology is coming in. It's doing a lot of things that we do. Um, it's it's augmenting our presence. Uh, I'm one of the people that that is very optimistic about technology, so I'm not going to say it's going to take over, but it is augmenting our presence. It's augmenting the way we work. It's augmenting the way we learn, the way we study. So it's very important for us to equip ourselves and the next generation with literacies, with skills, with ideas, with thought frameworks that will allow them to navigate through all of this. And this is why we want to make sure that we instill this kind of thinking in our education system, especially in Kuwait. So I want to make sure that I I have kids that grow up in a world where, where they are able to use their imagination, where they're able to become lifelong learners who, who want to, to, to be explorers of new ideas and, and new things and, and be able to cultivate that sense of belonging in a world that is continuously growing um, and changing and however also becoming very interconnected so to us it's it's especially in Kuwait and especially in the context that we're in it's very important for us to start the conversation about bringing this kind of thinking into the K through 12 education system. So we want to make sure that this happens. But because we're talking about kids who are um, who are more on the imaginative side, kids who still embody that um, that that beautiful, you know, nature that has not yet been, um, uh, I don't want to say tainted, but uh, that has not been exposed to a lot of the different ideologies and different ideas um, around the world, it's not easy to get them to maybe verbally express how they see the future. And uh, it might not be as easy for them to find the right words to say when they're talking about the future. Some of them are even too young to fathom the idea of time. So if you talk about future, um, even if you say 10 minutes from now, if I say, you know, within five days, um, my five-year-old, if she asks me, um, when are we going to go, you know, when are we going to go to to play? And I say, well, in, 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 you know, on Sunday. So she says, so how many days is that? I say four days. And then she says, so if I count, she knows there are 24 hours. So she says, if I count to 24, five times, is that? Five days, I said, no, honey, it's much longer than that. But still, we have to find a way to conceptualize the future for kids. And just by being exposed to organizations such as Teach the Future and and working with a lot of colleagues, um, and um, I have to give um, uh, an amazing shout out to two people who have been extremely supportive for us in this journey. Um, uh, Amna has been an absolute, absolute resource. Um, she has been a cornerstone uh, for us in this journey. And I would give a shout out to Lourdes as well. Um, so we've had multiple conversations about integrating art and um, and getting kids to really understand what it means to think about the future. And we found that by using art as a medium, for them to kind of play around with, they were able to find a second language, right? That allows them to express how they see things happening and maybe um, what they envision for a certain idea or for a certain element um, without really feeling that pressure of Um, Am I saying it right? Am I doing it right? Because art is just, you know, is just that it's it's for everybody. So we wanted to make sure that we laid out the grounds for for the kids um, to be able to imagine those different possibilities of 
um, of different worlds, um, making sure that we uh, put them through these different transformative learning experiences where they're able to safely ask questions. They're encouraged to play around with different roles. Um, we wanted them to feel this connection to whatever it is, the theme that we were we were discussing at that time. So one of, you know, some of the benefits that we found from integrating art um, with future literacy is that, you know, kids are able to truly kind of master their emotions at that time. They're able to, um, you know, some of the kids colored how they felt about something. And you can see those feelings coming up in their color choices and how they wanted uh, to relay this information for us, um, you know, allowing them to think critically, think on their feet, um, you know, just feel safe, that that psychological safety in general um, was really um, something that we, we kind of were hoping to get. So talking about creativity and, and talking about imagination and, and the marrying of of, you know, futures literacy and futures thinking and, you know, bringing that through art, that has shed tremendous light on, on how much work we still need to do in our own education system, especially in Kuwait. Um, I must have had this conversation a million times with people around the world and, and we always almost reach the same conclusion, um, talking about how unexcited we are about the current education systems and what they're doing to to the generations and generations of children um, that are going through it, and how at some point in time, your creativity and imagination is 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 almost beaten out of out of children. Um, to make sure that you do fit within that standardization that is the current education system. And that is no different in Kuwait, unfortunately. And this is something that we are trying to enhance. This is something that we are trying to um, to kind of go around when it comes to giving the children their imagination back. Um, we're going to need that, you know, for the days to come. We're We're going to need our kids, our future decision makers to think in a different way uh, to be able to solve some of the problems that we are leaving them with, unfortunately. So why is this important to us? Why are we very adamant to integrate? And I love that word. Um, it was used by um, uh, one of our uh, attendees in Penning. Um, uh, why do we want to integrate this kind of thinking within our school system? Why do we want our kids to be able to think differently? Um, it's for me, it's almost a personal thing. For me, it's uh, it's watching my own children talk about the future, and maybe it's because they're they're able to hear some of my conversations, but when they talk about not having a choice in the matter, when they talk about how they have to do what we have to say all the time, um, when they talk about going to school as if it's a chore or a punishment, that should be a trigger for not just me, but for everybody who wants to develop a generation that is truly engaged, the generation that is empowered, that is enabled to make changes that maybe we cannot make as a generation. And, and that, the personal element of this, just watching my kids play with their Lego set one day and discuss the future school so they're building this school using their Lego set. And 
I started asking them questions about it. And I, I, you know, and and this is what I hear. This is what they tell me how the schools will be. And, and so they say, I don't understand, mommy, why we have to go to school, why we have to wake up at six o'clock in the morning and go to school. Why shouldn't schools be open all day? Our school is going to be open all, all day. Our school is going to be built in a garden. And it's going to have shops that are run by the senior students where they're able to start their own businesses and make their things. It's going to have places where we can build things with wood. Um, teachers are going to are, are, are there to help us learn if we need to. Uh, we can wear whatever we want. Most of the classes are art classes. And that just clicked for us. So when when they're asking for things like, we want to express all, ourselves more. We want to be able to do more with art. They they want to connect more with that. It, it these things were were triggers for us to try to move forward with some of the things that we we were doing. And so I would love to share with you today, um, just our experience with creating the the Futurists Art Camp. Um, and it was a pilot that we ran in Kuwait. Um, uh, a, f- a few years ago, uh, but um, at the the impact of that is is still carried over. So we're launching um, uh, the new and improved uh, version of that. So we've accepted uh, participants between the ages of five and and ten in that camp, and um, it, the camp was was ran as an out of school camp. Um, and um, we only got the kids for about four hours in the evening, and it ran for about seven days. And we actually located the camp at um, an art studio that was um, uh, that was for one of the art professors um, in Kuwait, and we wanted them to focus on a specific theme. So they selected. Uh, you know, we had we had multiple team uh, themes going on. So the kids kind of came up with the idea of talking about friendship. So they wanted to discuss, you know, friendship communities and and how, you know, how these things would, you know, might look in the future. Uh, we engaged them with a few questions, uh, but it's it's worth noting that in this camp, we not only did you know, we're, we're ourselves, you know, we're myself there as the person that was facilitating the future literacy and the futures conversation. But we also had, um, this is Dr. Jawahar al-Badir, who was also the, um, she's a professor in art. And we also had, um, our colleague, um, as well, that was a play psychologist. And we wanted to make sure that we, we understood why children were saying the things that they were saying. We wanted to make sure that we got the insights that we needed and that they got the information that they needed um, by creating, you know, a, 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 a safe environment for them with the presence of, of the play psychologists, just in case we had a lot of uh, personal things come up in the conversation. So we asked the kids, um, you know, what do they think about the future? When do they think the future is? And, and, you know, and talking about friendship and talking about the community, um, what does friendship mean to them today? And, you know, how do they think they they will make friendships in the future? Um, where will they spend uh, time with their friends in the future? And uh, one of the, I think one of the, the, the main lessons that I learned personally by running this camp was, that I have probably started off underestimating how intelligent these kids were because we were trying so hard to simplify the questions to that age group. However, we, we realized that, that while we're asking those questions, kids were getting us. They, they, they understood what we're trying to say. They, they, filtered it the way they wanted to filter it, but they gave us the answers to the questions that we asked, even though I personally thought, oh, maybe I need to ask the question in a simpler way. So one of one of the key takeaways, if you're listening, do not underestimate children <laughs> and the intelligence of children. They will surprise you. They will absolutely surprise you. Uh, 
So we got them to start thinking about friendship. And one of the things that we we asked them to do, and I and and that was another main takeaway for us was how optimistic they were about the future. And and it it was very evident, uh, especially when we asked them to kind of use colors to describe their feelings about the world today. And then we asked them to also use colors to describe feelings about, you know, the future and about their friends in the future. And the colors they chose for today were mainly black, red, gray, um, but the future colors were blues and whites and purples. And even the, the the way that they were drawing and the way they were coloring the spaces where where they will be enjoying themselves and the spaces that they will be, um, you know, engaging with their friends, those spaces took on a very different look. And so if you see in this image, um, this is a picture of where she will be spending time with her friends. And this is actually located in space. So to her, she's going to be able to visit with her friend in this pod, in this shape, um, in space. Where you know where where you know they're going to be able to have you know conversations and and we asked them if they were going to feel safe in this space and they were extremely confident that this was going to be um, you know somewhere that they're going to enjoy. So one of one of the things that also stuck with us was that they 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 tried very hard to match what they thought we expected from them. And and that was something that drove us even more to try to integrate this kind of thinking, especially within um, this age group, because they believe that they have to make us happy all the time. They have to make the adults happy. So when they started the first day and the second day, when they started, they would if I asked them to do something or to draw an image, when they picked up the color, they would look at me first. They almost wanted a confirmation from me that, yeah, this is okay, go ahead, use this color. But as the days progressed, they just started you know, coloring, they started uh, drawing just right off the bat. They did not wait for anybody's confirmation. They did not wait for anyone to you know to engage with them they they took charge of the process and they they moved forward with it another thing that we noticed was when they first started in the camp the kids were on their best behavior so they came into the camp they sat properly on their chairs they they spoke only when spoken to they communicated as if they were talking to their teachers in school. And then as the camp progressed, we started seeing this. Kids laying on the ground, uh, you know, feeling extremely comfortable. They're, you know, they're playing around. They're engaging with each other. They're they're getting their hands dirty. They're getting their clothes dirty. They're not worrying about making us happy. They're not worried about making sure that me as an adult... Um, you know, are, are okay with what they're doing. They truly engaged with the process and, and they they started discussing the future in a more vocal way, even when they used art as a medium for that, which encouraged these conversations. But they they used their paintings as the basis to start those conversations. And they would kick off the conversations like, so what did you draw, Khalid? And then Khalid would answer, oh, well, this is what I drew. This is how I'm going to find friends in the future. And this is where we're going to hang out. And then they start discussing. But they used that main painting, that first drawing or painting or the color choice. They used that as almost the conversation starter. So that was 
another great thing that we picked up during the camp where we started seeing that not only are they engaging, but they're really um, feeling very comfortable with the process and they're starting to act like kids, which was really, really great. So bringing all of this together and, and, and understanding how just by simply putting them in this creative space, um, giving them certain tools, giving them some blank canvases, guiding their conversation ever so lightly, making sure that, that we do discuss the future literacy skills. However, what we really wanted to do was to show them those skills. So if we're talking about being agile, then we need to show them how being agile looks like. If we're talking about being resilient, then we really wanted to show them what resilience could look like. So by asking those questions, by bringing them into this conversation, um, allowing them to have a voice in just as simple as, you know, an activity as uh, where, what color do you think I need to color this painting? What, where, how, you know, where should I put my house? Do you think I should put it here or there? What we realized, the one, um, let's say, component that was missing from this whole conversation in our education system was truly agency. Our kids do not have agency anymore. Our kids do not have a choice. And if I really want, if me and you and everybody else that cares about what the future looks like at some point in time, if we want to truly empower, to truly transform the way those children think, then we need to give them an you know, that agency, we need to empower them to understand that you have a say in how this world is going to look like. Because if you remember Talal from the beginning of our conversation, the one thing that he kept saying was, I have to, I have to do this. I have to do that. I don't have a choice, Menal. I need to do this. I need to do it this way. So if we want to truly embody the values of what it means to understand the future and to impact the future, then one of the main things that we need to do is we need to give those kids agency. So what do we do moving forward? And this is something that we are we're trying to work on currently with the education system in Kuwait, and we would love to um, engage as many partners as possible, whether, um, you know, parents or the community. Um, we're trying to create as many awareness um, interventions as possible where we are um, allowing parents to understand the impact of having their kids think about the future in this structured manner in this way. Um, we're trying to um, get um, the educators to access different resources for professional development, trying to get them to understand more about what it means to teach the future and have you know, the future be part of their conversations in the classrooms. Um, talking about curriculum redesign, trying to, to approach um, the authorities, the, the, um, the ministries responsible for, you know, for education in, in Kuwait and um, providing them with the, you know, the resources that they might need to take a second look at what is it that we are um, asking our kids to learn about. It's it's one thing, honestly, I mean, to, to, to learn math and science and literature and art, and but it's a different conversation when you allow the, you know, the learner to 
play around with this information, whichever way they want, and to apply it to something that they can see and and understand and fathom and bring to life. Um, it's it's very important. We're we're not seeing this as much, especially um, here in Kuwait, where we've had multiple conversations with different school districts. Um, we tr- we you know we we try to highlight the idea that beyond the walls of the school, our children today with the current education system um, cannot understand the value of the information that they've been asked to memorize. Um, to be evaluated uh, on later. And one of the easiest ways to get them to think differently about something is to integrate futures thinking into the curriculum. I mean, as an adult, um, it it has taken me to completely different places, just thinking about my work, thinking about, um, you know, our market, opening up multiple opportunities and possibilities just because I started looking at things differently and I started using those skills differently. So by understanding the value of having these skills integrated into our system and by using the the ever so loved medium of art, especially for children, we can bridge this conversation between our kids in the classrooms today, between the educators in the classroom, between the parents, between the community, and truly give those kids the sense that they do have a say in this world. So, you know, just before I wrap up, um, I, you know, I, I honestly, it's, it's one of the most, um, personal experiences for me to when I engage in talking about futures thinking. And I think maybe, uh, maybe Amna knows that and um, other, uh, my, you know, my other colleagues at, at um, the uh, Teach the Future, uh, they probably have heard me say this, but it's, it's something that I don't take very lightly. And I, I do feel that this is one of the very few ideas in the world um, that are really worth spreading. It's it, it, it just the value that it gives it, you know, allowing, allowing our children, allowing ourselves to look at the different possibilities that might come about um, the tolerance that it gives you for yourself and for others and for other ideas and for other ways of thinking the humbleness that you have once you start engaging in this, in that you are part of something that is huge, that you are part of this great collective intelligence that is trying to guide this world into, into a better place. So um, it has been a privilege to take part. This is my first, um, uh, you know, um, Futures Day um World Futures Day conversation, and I'm, I'm I've been very privileged to take part in that, and I thank each and every one of you for for sticking around and hearing what I have to say, and thank you, Amna, for for your support in this. Thank you, Dr. Ronaldo. It was so nice to hear about your insights with how you you've used art as a medium for kids to express themselves. I really like the transition where you mentioned how the kids first came in, but they were all thinking that, oh, it's going to be like a classroom. I have to sit properly. I have to only speak when the teacher speaks. But then as time progressed, you saw them really open up to this concept of, you know, creative expression and freedom to do what they would like to do. So it's really interesting to see how, you know, young kids think that, oh, we have to do something that will make the adults happy you know because we don't want to be either scolded or we don't want to be you know considered naughty i guess yes so- yes you can choose the words there we we we've given this so many words for them to choose from it's sad truly <laughs> yeah so to, it's interesting to see how they sort of like changed and adapt their behavior based off of what 
they think the expectations might be. And you would think that, oh, you know, they're still young, like they won't really remember it, but they do because that's how people grow. You know, we like remember things and those build off of our experiences. And when you grow and you become an adult, it kind of, I would say, does translate whatever, however you lived your childhood. So it's, yeah. it's amazing to see the work that you are doing with the kids in Kuwait. Thank if you so much. Has, for... Yeah, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Munal, please you can unmute yourself. You can drop the drop a question in the chat. If there are none, I have two questions that I'm going to ask you. I'm just going to <laughs> wait. Let's see how the room is. Okay, so I am going to ask you my question. Okay. So how did you like come up with the idea of using art specifically? I know we've had a similar conversation before, but I would really like to know how you thought that, you know, we could use art specifically and why not another medium? I'm just curious about that. So um, one of the easiest ways, I mean, just personally, just from me dealing with my own kids, one of the easiest ways um, for me to get my kids to tell me anything, um, I'd ask them how your day was and they, you know, they're good. I'd get that answer, right? So I, I you know, yeah. I, I needed more as, you know, as a mother, I'm very interested. How, do, how did your day go? But if I ask them, um, draw something exciting that happened today in school. So then they would go and they would really go all out in, you know, in drawing this, this image for me with all the friends and all the participants in this situation. And then they would come to me and then they would have to digress throughout that story to tell me, you know, oh, you know, well, before that, this and this and this happened. So that kind of, that you know, that, that stuck with me as we were trying to think, how can we get this conversation to, to the children without making it really go over their heads, right? Because sometimes these questions can be so deep that they might, you know, might not really make sense to a child. And like I was saying, it's it's even the concept of time sometimes is not that clear for them. So just consulting with a few friends and, and especially talking to, um, to our, um, uh, our art uh, partner, uh, Dr. Jawahar at that time, um, it was very easy for us to to just realize that was the best way for us to go, and her way of of bringing the technic technical part of art, which I'm not an artist, so um, I, I you know I wouldn't be able to do that. I I can't tell you a straight line from <laughs> from a a circle, but with her, she was able to use our questions and then integrate her technical side with that to, to really get the kids to elaborate artistically on what is it that they were trying to say. But um, it, like I said, it was a pilot. So it was for us, it was really trial and error, but the impact that we've had since then, and just, you know, parents continuously asking us, we if, if we launch it today, we probably got a year waiting list. <laughs> Um, you know, for people to run to run through this, it's it, it just I, I guess they saw a lot of um, a lot of good change in their children uh, after they got out of the camp. There is a comment in the chat. Oh, we also have somebody raising their hand. Yeah. Would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Hasawi. Uh, yes. Having gone through uh, the Kuwait uh, education uh, system yourself, uh, what are the key things uh, that you think uh, needed to be addressed, uh, which then brought you to bring uh, the art and the futures uh, studies together uh, in this uh, presentation? And then uh, maybe the second question would be, uh, what is the is there a buy in in terms of uh, changing the mm -hmm. curriculum uh, going forward uh, from 
the authorities uh, in the country. Uh, thank you. So I, I love your questions. Thank you so much, Peting, right? I said that correctly. Um, yes, that's correct. Good. Um, so going through the education system myself um, in Kuwait, we one of the key things that I that I'm trying to uh, kind of navigate around with my own children is attaching our almost our self-worth and the value that we assign to ourselves to the outcome of the system. So if you are an A student or a B student or a C student, that has some kind of an implication on how you are viewed as a person, right? And, and that has always kind of baffled me because I wasn't that that great in school that great in school I I got bored very easily um sometimes I couldn't keep up in school um I was hyperactive at at some point and and I didn't an accepting system you're either part of that you know standard look or you're not and that's very dangerous to be honest with you like that to me that cannot continue um if we want to develop a more um inclusive if we want to develop um a more tolerant open-minded generation that attaches their self-worth to what they give back to the world, um, to truly something that matters, right? Um, not a grade. I'm one of those parents that tells my kids, I don't care about your grades. I really don't care if you give get an A or get a B. What I care about is that you've done your best and you've you know, you, you've learned as much as, as you can. So that's that's one of the things that I've really struggled with in this education system. Uh, for your second question, have have they responded to, to um, us requesting uh, that we revisit the curriculum? Absolutely not. They have not. And um, I, I still get people that ask me to get out my, my crystal ball because I'm a futurist and I, you know, and I talk about the future. So, um, so we're still, we're still trying to push the idea um, of what it means to truly think about the future, that we're not predicting the future, right? But we're, we're trying to influence the different parts of it by what we do today. So it's still an ongoing conversation, not only with, you know, the, the education um, uh, part of, of government, but we're also, um, uh, you know, discussing this with with people in, in the planning arm in the government, um, you know, and, and all the ones that are partially responsible to set the future of, of this country. So thank you so much. Those were great questions. Thank you so much for sharing that. We did have two more comments in the chat. Maybe if we can briefly have a look. So somebody asked about using music, dance, theater, play, competition, and those other mediums. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, my God. Please do it. And if you do it, please contact me and tell me how it went. <laughs> because that's that's next on my list, especially drama. Right. So I think acting and drama is is probably the, the you know, the 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 second closest choice right after that. So, yes, please, if you do it, let me know how it goes. I'm, I'm very interested in that. Great. There was another comment about having small groups in classroom sizes. In terms of that, what are your thoughts? So what do you think? So we, uh, I don't know if you guys heard, uh, but during COVID, there's a, a new concept of schooling kind of came up. It, 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 it wasn't that new, but I think it just got augmented during COVID. It's called micro schooling. 
So you, they started, you know, doing these these lessons at a teacher's house where there's one teacher and maybe, you know, four or five students. But the impact of reducing the size of the class, you know, from 30 kids to only five kids where they're able to engage, where the teacher's attention was divided equally, where, you know, it allows you to look at, to, to really value the personal differences in the way they learn and the way they engage and the way they communicate, where now, you know, we can't really expect that of a teacher who's managing a class of, of you know, minimum 28 you know, 30, 35 kids in, in a classroom. So yes, take, you know, take a look at that. Take a look at, you know, um, micro schooling. It's, it's, it's been, you know, such a wonderful concept that I, I love to see it even grow more. So. Thank you so much for sharing that. We are nearing the end of this amazing session. And we want to thank you for participating in World Future Day. There will be new facilitators and conversations happening this new hour and all the way until we finish today. And if you're available, we encourage everyone to stay on for the next session. If not, you can also join later on today. In the chat box, I will be dropping a participation survey, which can be filled out to receive a certificate of participation. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Manal, for joining us and sharing about the amazing work you have been doing in COVID. Thank you so much for having me. Great. So moving on, let me just share my screen really quickly.